Welcome to the Safety Solutions. Hey folks, welcome to the Safety Solutions Academy Google Hangout. We had some technical difficulties in our original Hangout. Uh, it was DOA, dead on the air. We've restarted another Google Hangout. We're working through some technical difficulties, but the good news is I have my cohort, Grant Cunningham, uh, joining me here on the, the line. How are you doing today, Grant? I am terrific, and and you know, you, you know, I'm a big fan, of course, of the Safety Solutions Academy Hangout, and I am such a big fan, Paul. I want you to see this. I want you to see what I'm giving up tonight to be on the Safety Solutions Academy Hangout. Now, see this. I don't know if you can see this right here. This is a New York steak, a delicious, medium rare, actually on the rare side of medium rare New York steak, and not just any New York steak, Paul. Not just any New York steak. This is a Highland beef New York steak. This is the beef that the Queen of England eats, Paul. I am giving up royal beef to be here on the Safety Solutions Academy Hangout. This is what I'm giving. This is how important this hangout is. I would re I really appreciate that, Grant. I mean, I almost want to call royal bullshit on uh, the, the King Eats the Steak, but hey, no, you know No, it's what? true. That's true. I need to look that up, Grant, because I am a steak lover. I have, uh, I don't know, probably seven or eight pounds of uh, prime rib roast that's uh, thawing up on the counter right now, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, <laughs> it looks like we've got some viewers that are joining us back. I appreciate that. Over on the right-hand side of the screen, if you could please uh, put in your questions, your answers. Tell us who you are, where you're from, what you're about. We want to interact with you tonight. We had uh, uh, at least a dozen folks in here earlier, and all of a sudden the connection just went dead, and that was it. That was over. It took us about, I don't know, what do we have here? We're now looking at 9.57. It took us about 20 minutes to get the interwebs back and up and running. So hopefully some folks will join us. But if not, those of you out there in the YouTube world, you will get to see this. And today we're talking about concealed carry as a system, the system of concealed carry. And that's what I want to talk about. Before we do that, I want to give you a couple of reminders. First of all, the Safety Solutions Academy Google Hangout is awesome. It's on the rare side of medium rare as far as information goes about uh, um, personal protection, about unraveling the, the complexities of defensive training and demystifying the gun. And today, we're going to demystify the sealed carry system with Grant Cunningham, author, expert, and defensive shooting instructor. Um, I want you to take right now up on the top of the screen, right up there, uh, highlight that URL. And if you're watching us live, share it right now out on Twitter and Facebook. Let people know that you're at the Safety Solutions Academy Google Hangout talking about the concealed carry system. If you're catching us on YouTube, um, that's okay. You're not live, but that's all right. Go ahead and put that URL up at the top of your browser and share that as well. Let people know where you're at, what you're doing, and uh, send people to check out this video that are interested in concealed carry as a system and getting better at concealed carry, being able to conceal carry more efficiently. That's what we're all about. So if you can do that, that would be fabulous. Second of all, go ahead and interact with us. Yes, excellent. Bruce is back. Thank you, Bruce. I'm glad that you're back. I see that you don't have a question right now. Hopefully you'll have one in a little while, but I'm glad you made it back. Sorry for the technical difficulties, buddy. Second thing that I want you to do is I want you to interact, just like Bruce did. We've got um, we've got questions and answers that are here. The reason here is for you folks out there in the audience. If you've got a question, ask it, and we will do our darndest to get you a quality answer that you can use to streamline concealed carry for you to protect yourself, to protect your loved ones. Sound pretty good? Before we go further, I do want to give you folks a, a brief update. I'm going to leave all of the pre-show banter, which it, it, it'll upload to YouTube. It'll be there. But just so you folks know, one of our own, Matt DeVito, a combat-focused shooting instructor, which both Grant and I are, um, a defensive shooting instructor, a young and upcoming instructor who's very active in the business, one of the busiest young instructors that's out there in the industry, he and his family suffered a difficult blow last night. Everyone is physically okay. Um, however, their home was involved in a fire. They weren't at home. Um, looks like a total loss, and unfortunately, they weren't insured for the value of their home and the contents inside. And so we're asking for help tonight. If you can head to safetysolutionsacademy.com forward slash Matt, there's a description that's there. Um, there is a, a whole uh, a link is what's really important. Focus on the link, click on the link, and donate a few dollars. Whatever it is that you can afford to spare, share that with Matt and his family so they can get back on their feet. To date, at this point in time, 
Um, the, the website went live at about 2 o'clock this afternoon, and there was more than $9,500 raised by the time the show started at 9.30. So I'm doing an update. I'll let you know what the, what the total is at here in a little bit. So thank you for that. Again, safetysolutionsacademy.com forward slash Matt. You can read the story and click on the link to make a donation. Thank you so much. All right, Grant, let's dive into the topic. So here is the problem that I have, and I don't know what it is that you have, but you know, I've had multiple phone calls. I've got a class on Saturday and multiple phone calls from brand new shooters, and what they want to talk about is they want to talk about the gun, the gun, the gun, the gun. Concealed carry revolves around the gun in people's minds. The problem with that is they're wrong. The gun is just one part of a system. Have you found that same thing as an Yeah, I, I, what I've found is, strange enough, people will go out and spend uh, huge amounts of money uh, on a gun very often uh, uh, and customize it or a customized gun. Uh, they'll spend a huge amount of money on it, and then they'll stick it in uh, a $10 holster you know, or you know, a $15 holster, and they'll put it on a flimsy belt from, from Walmart. And... Uh, that just doesn't work very well because it does, it all works as a system together and it's silly to have you know, a gun of that level and not carrying it in something that will carry it uh, and conceal the gun because the, 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 conceal, the, the system that goes around it is important to, to concealing it. Absolutely. And it's important in terms of the comfort that, that you have with carrying it um, it's really not the size of the gun that determines how comfortable it is. It's the system around it, the system you use to carry it. And it also affects how efficiently you can get that gun into play when you really need it. Uh, if you can't reach it or, or the gun flops around or it's not in the position where you expect it to be, it all affects how efficiently you can get the gun into play when you really need it. So the system that goes around the gun is at least as important and, and perhaps in many cases more important than the gun itself. I agree with that, Grant, and one of the reasons why I agree with you in the idea that it is is because if the system doesn't work well together, you may very well let that gun just drop out of your routine. That mm -hmm. expensive gun that you bought isn't on your hip or your waistband or wherever it is that you carry it when you need it most because it wasn't comfortable, it wasn't concealable, it was too heavy. The list goes on and on for the excuses, but really what it comes the tool you needed most wasn't there, wasn't accessible at the time when you needed it most. You might as well have not wasted all the effort and energy to have in the first place. And that's, that's really the biggest concern. So so let's do that. Did you have something you want to throw in there, Grant? Go ahead. Yeah, there's, there's one other thing to, to keep in mind. You talked about the gun not being available when you need it. One of the other problems with a with a concealed carry system that is that doesn't work very well is that sometimes it can let the gun drop out when you didn't realize it, which makes it then a safety hazard, uh, besides the fact that you don't have it when you need it, now it's a safety hazard. Absolutely, and that can definitely be um, an issue. We have to definitely be care careful of that. Hey, Spencer, how you doing? Uh, I can see you down there. Looks like you got a backstage pass, just like uh, it was, it was uh, Kelly Boatwright did a couple weeks ago. Enjoy us. Um, you can sit there. I muted you out, so you won't be able to chime in, but Enjoy sitting down there. You see him. Oh, we got a bunch of people. Benjamin's in the backstage. Awesome. I'm going to mute you out, but you just stay right there. Um, and Joe Gianni is mentioning right now that he had a chance while we were down with technical difficulties to be able to donate to Matt's cause, and I appreciate that. And yeah, we're up over ten thousand dollars now, folks. That is awesome. I feel like I'm running a telethon, and we should have some singers and dancers come out here in a couple minutes. But you know, I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, like I can dance. Yeah, that would be awesome, Grant. You're a fabulous dancer. I, I appreciate that. Let's let's go ahead, Grant, and talk specifically about the different parts of that system. We mentioned the big one, the gun, and I'm just going to go ahead and run down what I see as the components, and I want you to add in anything that you think I leave out or delete something if you think I add any extra in. We've got the gun, the magazines, the ammunition, the holster the belt, the pants, which I separate from the rest of the clothing for, for a couple of reasons, and then our cover garments, and finally, we've got the other tools we might carry to support the firearm, and then you can't leave out, you know, the last thing John Steinbeck 
disappointed. We've got the brain. That's an important part. Anything you want to add into there, Grant? Anything you think about that uh, that you needs to be added or should be deleted out of there? Um, did you did you mention the belt? I did. I did. Okay. Throw yep, okay. Absolutely. Your 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 uh, audio is cutting in and out just a little bit, so I wasn't sure you said that. I'll check my connections, but my guess is is that I'm just having bandwidth issues tonight. I, think um, I don't know happening. if uh, maybe Netflix has the new series of. Uh, I don't know. America's got talent available, and everyone in the neighborhood is streaming that. But that's the situation that we're in. So let's go ahead, Grant, and let's start. We've already covered the gun in previous Google Hangouts. So if you have questions about that, check out our other Google Hangouts. You can learn about what it is that makes a defensive firearm, and we'll go from there. Um, anything you want to say about ammunition, Grant, since that's right there with the gun? Uh, I think, and we, talk, we talked a little bit about ammunition in some of the other hangs out, it's just sort of passing. And the, I think the thing that we need to talk about when we talk about ammunition as part of the system is that what we want is ammunition that will deliver the maximum amount of incapacitation potential to the target. And what we're lo really looking to do is incapacitate the target. And of course, the way we're going to do that is we're going to use hollow point ammunition. Uh, in this day and age, I, except perhaps in New Jersey. I don't know if New Jersey still outlaws hollow point ammunition, but in all the rest of the 50 states, uh, we can use hollow point ammunition. And Mass IU has done a terrific series uh, over on Backwoods Home why we use hollow point ammunition. And, and to go over all the reasons would take us the rest of the show, just go read that. It's a great article about why we use hollow point ammunition. But what we're looking for is ammunition, uh, hollow point ammunition, preferably bonded hollow point ammunition because those are going to be the latest and best uh, uh, hollow point designs from a major manufacturer. And I, and I tell people this is important because I want to make sure that my ammunition not only it has really good quality control because that's really important, but I also want to know that the manufacturer is capable of keeping exemplar lots of that ammunition on hand in case my defense team needs it to help me defend myself uh, against wrongful prosecution arising from a self-defense incident. So hollow point ammunition, uh, bonded hollow point ammunition from a major manufacturer. Um, and I think that's the important part of that. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent point, Grant. And one of the things that people don't necessarily understand is that whole concept of the exemplar lot. And smaller ammunition manufacturers may not do that. And what an exemplar lot is, is it's simply a sample from each lot that the manufacturer keeps on hand and keeps accessible in case you need that for testing related to a trial um, where either civil or criminal issues are being resolved in a court of law. And, and we need to have an unbiased source of ammunition. I could keep an extra box in my safe but it's going to be pretty hard for a, a jury to buy the fact that I didn't do something to tamper with that if it's been in my control. I'm trying to prove my... So having that manufacturer have that exemplar ammunition is definitely the best case scenario. So that's an excellent point that you bring up there, Grant. The other thing that I want to bring up about... Um, it can't just be any old hollow point bonded ammunition. It's got to be stuff that works with your firearm. You a test, and I know this is expensive, and I know this is painful, but you need to test that ammunition with your firearm. Check that out, and uh, have to keep muting people out. I apologize. When we get to ten, no more, nobody else will be able to join, so that'll be the good news. Um, but uh, uh, you you need to make sure it functions with your ammunition. So that means after you function checked your firearm with. 150 to 200 rounds of standard target ammunition, that's what I recommend, you're going to take a box of 20 or two boxes of 20, maybe a box of 50, and go to the range and shoot that ammunition, and you're looking for no malfunctions. Then, then it's time to purchase that ammunition, put it into the magazines, which all I'm really going to say about magazines is they need to work with your gun as well. You know, this is a system. They have to, guns, magazines, ammunition have to work together. They have to be tested together. Then you're ready to carry that gun and that ammunition. Anything you want to add to that, Grant? 
Yeah, I would I would say don't buy aftermarket aftermarket magazines. Typically, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, buy magazines from the manufacturer that you know are going to work in the gun. And I, I realize, and uh, thankfully, this usually isn't so much of a problem with a, with with most of the guns on the market. But we do run into some occasions where people will say, "Gosh, the manufacturer's magazines are so expensive that I can save a few bucks by buying these aftermarket magazines." Just don't buy the manufacturer's magazines that you know are going to work. Um, the only exception to that really our uh, 1911 shooters will typically want to buy all kinds of aftermarket magazines to get an extra round in. Um, and for the 19, guys out there who just insist upon shooting a 1911 for a defensive firearm, seven round magazines. Don't mess with the eight round magazines. Yeah, I realize that everybody says that they're great. They're really not. Stick with the standard uh, seven round magazines. Those work. Don't mess with anything else. That's interesting, Grant, because um, I've actually, when I was in my 1911 days and felt that that was the best firearm that was ever created and ever would be created on a biblical scale for <laughs> the, of uh, or protection of my family, um, I was all about the eight-rounders from Chip McCormick and, and Wilson, and those magazines seemed to work pretty well for me while they worked, and then when the lips got out of tolerance or the spring got weak, um, but that's interesting, seven rounds and seven rounds only. Why is it that that seven-round mag is more reliable? Can you tell us about that? You know, when I think it's a lot of it is follower design. When I was shooting the 1911 in competition, too, uh, I used the Chip McCormick magazines. I, the Wilsons, I don't think, were out at the time. Uh, okay. But I was using Chip McCormick magazines. And I found consistently, like you did after a period of time, they just got to the point where they didn't work very well. The seven-round Colt magazines always worked. Okay. And uh, so I, I tell people, listen, if you're going to carry a 1911, just carry seven round magazines in it. Yeah, you'll you'll give up a round, but you already gave up a whole bunch of rounds by picking the 45 in the beginning. So uh, seven round magazines. It's a it's a really good point. You know, you also bring up a good point about the expense grant when it comes to magazines. A lot of people think that if they can buy that after aftermarket magazine, they're going to save some money because the factory magazine might be expensive. I gotta tell you, if, if you can't afford to buy the magazines for your gun that you need to carry and to train, sell that gun and get a gun that you can afford the magazines for. There are lots of guns out there that have good quality factory magazines that are reasonably priced that'll work well for you. And that might be one of those equipment upgrades that you just need to make. And, and maybe you don't see it as an upgrade, but if a gun's gonna perform better for you, you can actually afford to use the gun. Again, this is a system, and our resources are part of that system. If we on a specific kind of gun, it's time to move on. It's it's yeah. that simple. Let's let's move one step farther away from the gun. We've covered the firearm itself. Uh, in other the ammunition, we just addressed specifically bonded hollow points. I recommend heavy for caliber and make sure they work with your gun and with your magazines, factory magazines. The next thing is the holster. Now, um, a couple of things as we go back. Benjamin Turner says yes, New Jersey still hollow points, no go, illegal. Thanks for that, okay. Ben. Ben's not an attorney, but that's that's what he believes to be true, and I, I buy into what it is that Ben says. He lives over that. That would make a difference to him. Um, so that's an issue. And Joe also mentioned that he is a fan, as we're getting into holsters, of CompTAC holsters. He's had a good luck with those in the waistband holsters. So that's one of our one of our uh, hangout participants' opinions here tonight, and that's great. I've had a CompTAC as well, and it worked well. Grant, talk about the – I don't know if we want to – features, or what's the job of a holster? Let's start that way. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I missed some of that, but I think I got I got the last part of it, which I think is the okay. important part. Um, the job of a holster is to keep the gun securely in a consistent place. That's, that's really its entire job. If it protects the gun's finish, hey, that's a bonus. If it protects your skin from abrasion, hey, that's a bonus. But the important thing is that it hold the gun securely in a consistent place. And I talk about the consistent place because, of course, on the belt, if you're wearing a belt holster, typically it's going to help keep it in the same place. That's, that's generally a, a no-brainer. But we also sometimes talk about pocket holsters. And the job of a pocket holster, for instance, if you choose to carry that way, is to keep the gun in a consistent place and a consistent orientation so that you can get to it. So this is why I say that it needs to retain the gun and it needs to do so in a consistent place to the greatest degree possible. After that, we look for comfort and, and finish protection and all that other stuff that goes along with it. 
Absolutely, Grant. I, I agree with that. There's one thing that I would add that I think the holster does that's really very, very, very important, and that is that the holster covers the trigger guard of our firearm. In, in addition to keeping it in a safe place, it's very important to have that um, holster covering the trigger guard to make sure that we don't incidentally activate that trigger through some action where we don't want that to happen. Whether it's, um, you know, uh, imagine a, a gun simply in your waistband without the trigger guard covered, leaning against the corner of a counter. Could that enter the trigger guard and activate the trigger? That's a possibility. Um, sliding the gun into our, our clothing, guard covered, that's a possibility. So I definitely like to see, in addition to that holster being in uh, attached to the belt in a way that it stays where it's supposed to be all the time, I want that trigger guard covered. What are your thoughts on? It? Oh, I th I think so. In fact, that's one of the uh, one of the safety issues that we often talk about in terms of holsters. You know, back in the days when when everybody carried a revolver with a ten pound or an eleven pound trigger on it, having the trigger covered j wasn't as much of an issue. Well, today our triggers are a lot lighter, and right. and they're a lot shorter, and they're a lot easier to shoot. That's great, but it also means that they're a lot easier to accidentally shoot. And so a, a holster in this day and age, a holster that does not cover the trigger, and I mean completely on both sides, not just one side, both sides, is an absolutely critical thing. Uh, yep. It needs to do both. Yep, I agree with that, Grant, and I think that's pretty important. Now, I'll add one more thing that I would really like a holster to be able to do, and you kind of alluded to that when you said, hey, you know, somebody buys a $1,000 gun and gets a $10 holster, it doesn't make a lot of sense. The other thing I want to see a holster doing is I want to see the mouth of that holster stay open when the gun isn't in it. And this simply makes it easier for us to rehold one hand when we need to. And that is an, an outstanding feature. Um, when the shooting is over, we need to have a spot to put that gun. And the best place where it's safe, where it's secure, is going to be back into that holster. And so some kind of metal or plastic reinforcement around the mouth of the holster that's an outstanding feature to look for in a holster. And most quality holsters actually have that as an if not just the standard version of that holster. What are your thoughts on reholstering, Grant? Yeah, I think that the, we talk about holstering one-handed, and we're not talking about sort of this, you know, ninja kind of, you know, uh, you know, thing where they spin their sword around and put it in without looking at it. No, what we're talking about doing is getting the gun back in the holster at, after you've been in a shooting when you're, you know, you're, you're trembling, you're having, you're having a great deal of difficulty doing things, and you have to get your cover garment out of the way, and now you also have to hold open the mouth of the holster while you're putting a gun in it, and what usually happens is here's the hand that's holding the holster, here's the gun, the gun is usually, like, you know, pointing at the hand as you're trying to, to reholster it. After you've been in a shooting and you're, you know, like this, probably a really, really bad idea. It's bad in a training environment, uh, and it's bad in the aftermath of a shooting. So I want the holster, uh, when it's practical, there are certain designs of holsters like pocket holsters. It's, it's a little different, difficult. But if we're talking a belt holster, I want it to keep the mouth of the holster open by whatever means they do. Yeah, and, and the simple fact is, Grant, we may not have both hands to holster with when we need to. We may be occupied with that weak hand, whether it's you know holding direct pressure on a wound on our body, whether it's um, helping someone that we love to away from the area, whether it's talking to law enforcement on the cell phone and, and being given the direction to now holster the gun because law enforcement is on the scene. Those are all reasons why this hand might be out of the game, and it's so much easier if that mouth, that holster, stays open. So I definitely agree with that, no doubt about it. You now, know, the, uh, go ahead, Grant. The point I want to put out, point out is that we're not just talking about reholstering after after a shooting, because there are yep. lots of situations where we draw the gun, the bad guy gives up or runs away or whatever, and we're on the phone with 911. Uh, okay, we may not be in the aftermath of a shooting, but now we've got the phone or maybe our flashlight, whatever it is in one hand, and we're trying to reholster in in another, uh, the last thing we want to do is to shoot ourselves or have to mess around with the holster. So even if you, it, even in, in the case where we don't actually shoot, uh, that's when holstering is just as important as after we've actually had an incident. And, you know, Grant, let's, let's take it one step further away from the shooting itself. 
every time that you put a holster on and then put the gun into the holster, if that's how you handle things, it's nice to have the convenience and the added safety of a mouth that stays open on that holster all the time, so you don't have to keep your hand and get it in the way. So those are and all. If you're, yeah, if you're and if you're training, you absolutely have to have a, a holster that stays open. Uh, I can't think of any uh, really reputable trainers that want you to show up on a range with a holster that collapses all the time. That's right. We'll work with you if you do show up, yep. but we don't want. Yeah, no. we'd rather not. Yep. Now Justin Meese has chimed in with a, a, a comment, a question. And uh, I'm going to ask another question back to you, Justin. He said the N82 tactical holsters. I'm assuming N82 is a brand. I got to I got to tell you, I'm not necessarily the biggest gear guy anymore. I, I try and, in fact, yeah, I try not to pay attention to all these gear that's out there because there's so much it would just clutter my brain. His set his statement is the only complaint is the retention on. Otherwise, they've been great in testing. So, what do we feel about on or in the waistband holster? I'll go first on this one, Justin, and, and what it is that I need to see from retention is the same as what Grant talked about when it came to the holster on the body. I want the and the gun to stay in place relative to my body, no matter what the orientation of my body is. That means right side up, upside down, inside out, whatever the case might be. If I'm getting tumbled around, that gun better be in the same spot in the holster, in the same spot on my body. And if there's a problem with retention, that is a problem. Retention is important. Got to stay where it is. What are your thoughts, Grant? Yeah, I think so. One of the one of the issues that we have with the uh, hybrid type holsters in the N82, I just looked them up. It's a hybrid type holster um, using what appears to be neoprene in, in place of the leather. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah, near as I can tell. Um, one of the issues that we run into with with a lot of the the hybrid type holsters is retention. And and you're right. It is it, it is an issue. Now it, when we talk about and let's jump into this talk about retention because uh, it, 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 historically one of the the tests that we had for holsters we'd stick our unloaded gun in a verified unloaded gun and we stick it in the holster and we turn the holster up to down to see if it falls out and that was always the mark of a great holster. Well, it's not really the mark of a great holster because when we put it between the belt and our body, there's enough compression on the holster that if it has really good retention starting out, by the time you put some extra pressure on it, uh, you can't get the damn thing out of the holster when you really need to. So we want enough retention so that when it's on your body that you can roll around and do things without the gun coming out. And in some cases, that might mean that's, that when it's off of the body, it's loose. That's okay. The important thing is that when you've got it on, that it keep the thing from coming out accidentally. That's Excellent. the important part. So don't you know, go into fall for this idea that it needs to have really tight retention when it's off the belt. Uh, it may not. And it's important to think this through before you, you know, use a, a simplistic sort of metric like that to judge your holster. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point that you bring out there, Grant. And, and what I do want to throw out to you folks is the idea that we're talking about exclusively for concealed carry, unless, unless you feel differently, Grant, but I'm talking exclusively passive retention. I'm talking about friction and or you know bumps in the holster that keep the gun in place. I'm not talking about thumb brakes. I'm not talking about hoods. I'm not talking about you know needing to rock the gun forward, rotate it twice to the left, and you know, use your pinky to push a button. I'm talking specifically about passive retention that's overcome by your strength pulling that gun out of the holster. So keep that in mind as well. Yeah. Anything you want to that, Grant? Or are you on board? I, I think we talked. I think we talked about this once before. I don't remember if it was on a previous thing out, but we've talked about this, and that I I I don't like active safeties on a concealed holster for any number of reasons, but particularly because they usually take the form of a thumb break. And thumb brakes, all they do is increase the risk of an accidental discharge when you're reholstering the holster. Now you've got a holster that has to have two hands because you have to keep the silly thumb brake out of the way. So, yeah, passive, passive uh, retention is the key here. All right, let's take one more step out. And, folks, again, thank you very much for your questions and answers. Um, that makes these hangouts so much better. And I'm absolutely thrilled. I'm really disappointed about the technical difficulty, don't get me wrong, but I'm thrilled that we've got you know, five viewers that are joining us uh, watching, and we've got three, four, five folks that are actually in the Hangout with us. Those of you that are in the Hangout, if you want to throw up a question or a comment, you can do, th do so through the live chat 
Um, and, and I apologize for sending out the wrong link, but I'm glad you're here with us either way. So we'll take one more step away from the gun, and let's move to the belt. Grant, I'll let you start off on this one. Oh, man. Uh, the belt, as far as I'm concerned, is more important than the holster um, and for a number of reasons. First of all, the belt contributes a whole lot to the retention that the holster has. Um, very, very important. It contributes to the concealability of the gun, it concealed, and it contributes to the comfort of the gun. And, and here's why. A properly designed gun belt, in fact, I just happen to have a gun belt here, Paul. I'm so surprised. I'm so surprised. This is a, a gun belt from the uh, from the good folks at uh, uh, Eric Little uh, Rafter L um, Gun Leather. But a, a properly designed uh, gun belt is very, very torsionally stiff. And the reason this is important is because when you hang a gun onto this thing, what happens is the gun wants to do this. It wants to take the belt and go like this. And so what happens is that the butt of the gun ends up coming away from the body, which means you can't conceal it now, and the barrel of the gun, which is down here, ends up poking into your body, which makes it less comfortable. If it's less comfortable and less concealable, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to be wearing the thing. In addition, a really flimsy belt won't uh, support the holster and give the holster the retention it needs, the, uh, the tension grabbing the gun, a, uh, a weak belt, will essentially allow the holster to flex open so that the gun isn't retained as well. So the belt is incredibly important in terms of comfort and concealability and retention. In fact, you can take what would normally be a pretty crummy holster, put it on a good belt, and all of a sudden it changes character completely. Absolutely. So I, I think the belt is incredibly important, and I recommend that people spend as much money on the belt as they do on the holster, and I recommend people spend decent money on a holster. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, when I tell people that, you know, when, when they're getting into concealed carry, they say, well, how much is this going to cost me? You know, my response is simple. You know, if you have a $500 gun, understand that that $500 gun is a $1,000 investment. And they look at me, look, but by the time you spend money on magazines, on ammunition, on belt, on holster, it easily adds up to that. Now, I'm not as fancy as Grant is, or maybe I'm, you know, more technologically advanced. I'm one of those young hip kids, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm just a little bit over 40, but I've got a, a nylon belt here that, of course, nowadays has some plastic in it, and I can take this belt, I can squeeze it as hard as I can with two hands, and I can hardly make the belt bend. You can see that I, I put a little bit of a dimple, in it, and that is really what's fabulous about a belt. Now, Grant, that leather belt that you have is leather only. Well, in fact, most of the good leather belts that are being made today uh, are using some of that high-tech, you know, hip-hop stuff that you got. Um, they're using that in between the leather, and uh, a lot of the really good belt manufacturers today are putting uh, some sort of plastic, usually a polyethylene or something like that, in between the two layers of leather and using that to stiffen the belt, and it's a perfect marriage because Absolutely. you get the stiffness of of the of the uh, of the polymer and it doesn't wear out and you get the look and the and the feel of the leather. Uh, there are still a few uh, makers out there who do it all in leather and still do a really really good job, uh, but a lot of the newer makers are using that high tech polymer in the belt to stiffen it up and it really really works. I'm probably looking to make the move back to leather, Grant. And you know, this belt is is a Velcro belt, um, so you've got Velcro to secure with, and then a strap over the top. Um, you know, but I'm having some problems. You can see that my Velcro here is is just a fuzz disaster. Um, you know, it's 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 time to get back to the simple, you know, belt buckle, if you will, of of keeping that belt and that gun in place, keeping it the perfect tension all the time, and. And that's kind of what it is that I'm after. I'm probably going to head back in that direction. So um, size 38 grants for when you come out here for the revolver oh, class. Sure. 38 in black. Now, you know, one of the things I want to throw out there about, you, you mentioned has the look of leather. And look at a belt like this. Just threw it down to the ground. You know, This isn't necessarily an attractive belt that I would want people to be looking at. But remember, that doesn't really matter. Because this belt is most... Not always. Some people are carrying it, but but most of the time, this belt is going to be covered up, and so the belt isn't necessarily important. Focus on the function. Focus on the function. That's my tip on the belt. 
The uh, the only caveat I would make uh, to that is that uh, in in many cases, yeah, particularly if you work in a in a more um, informal environment, that's true. If, however, you're one of those people who's who has to carry a gun in, with a suit, belt's going to show. It has to. And uh, so you you definitely have to pay attention to what it looks like uh, to to people around you. So you have to think about how you're going to use these things because it is a system. I mean, the concealability of the belt or how you're going to conceal it is part of the system. So if you're one of those people who can wear something over the belt, hey, great. If you're one of those people that's stuck in a knot, and now I'm not and Paul's not. I mean, we don't have to worry about this. But if you're one of those people that's stuck in an office and you have to wear a suit and the belt's going to show, you're going to have to pay a little more attention. And by the way, you're going to spend more money. Sorry. That's the truth, Grant. You know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised I didn't remember. As you mentioned that, um, I'll tell a little story. I arrived in Orlando at the National Association of Sporting Goods Wholesalers show two years ago to meet with manufacturers, you know, conduct some interviews, do my regular business thing that I do. And I showed up with suits because I'm doing things. And my wilderness tactical... <laughs> And of course, of all people, the bald guy was like, oh, nice belt, douche. And he was right. It was definitely a mistake on my part uh, to show up in a suit with a, uh, a belt on. It was really kind of ridiculous. Um, Joe Gianti, Willoughby School of Gung Fu, has posted up a, a great question. And, and this really ties into uh, right now with belt and holster. And both of these things to the idea of carry the gun. And that's certainly part of the system. Now, Joe specifically asked me to comment on appendix carry. I'm an appendix carry guy. For those of you that don't know, let me see if I can do this without pulling out my, my microphone. Appendix means right here. This is where I carry my gun at, some people say, the 1 o'clock position. It's in the front of my pants, um, and I find that to be a fabulous place to carry my gun. There are a couple of reasons why. Let's start out with what it is that Grant was talking about when it comes to accessibility of that firearm. I want that to be accessible to me. The human animal, in general, when we deal with a threat, we have a tendency to square up to that threat, and we have a tendency to bring our hands up to protect ourselves from that threat. Um, even if we're in some kind of an interview position where we're interacting, our natural tendency is to bring our hands up into this high fence, as Craig Douglas would call it, to be able to react. Well, when I bring my hands into this position as a, as a human animal, it's for a couple of reasons. It protects the important stuff that's in the core of my body, but it also gives me ready access to my tools. And if you think about the um, uneducated thug that might throw a gun into their pants to carry, where are they going to put it? They'll probably put it right here. Why? Because it's easy to get to. They can quickly access that firearm. That's one of the great reasons why I want to have it there. It also puts it in a place where I can protect it. Just like I can protect my brain, my core, I can protect that gun. There's nobody that's going to sneak up behind me and reach all the way around and be able to that firearm. So those are a couple of reasons why I carry there. It's also just about everything that I do, whether it's driving, whether it's uh, doing work in the yard, whatever it might be, having the gun right here is easily concealable, easily accessible, easily protectable. I like it. I like it a lot. That's why I carry my firearm there. Grant, where do you carry your firearm, and why? Well, I, uh, I, I, I've i played a little bit with appendix carry, and, and the one thing I've discovered about appendix carry is that it's incredibly um, personally variable. Uh, some people find it very comfortable. Some do not. And for, some re for reasons that you sometimes don't think about, now, people who have a few extra inches around their uh, middle... Uh, typically aren't going to find it terribly comfortable, um, although I've run into people who do. I have a very short torso. I'm a, I'm a small guy, and I've got a short to torso. There's a very, very little room between my navel and the crease of, uh, of my legs when they're, when they're folded in a sitting position. And I, I just cannot find anything, no matter how short, no matter how long, no matter uh, how I uh, carry it, that I've been able to do it. Uh, appendix carry. I've played a little bit. In fact, I have. I've got an appendix carry holster here, designed specifically for appendix carry, from the folks at Filster that I've been playing with lately. Uh, and it, it's a little better, but I still have a great deal of trouble, even with this little short J frame uh, appendix carry holster. So for me, it doesn't work very well. 
Uh, I prefer it generally just behind my, I'm right-handed, so just behind my right hip. I don't wear it back as far as some people do because I, I really want better access than that. So I'll right. typically wear it just just off the point of the hip where it's concealable and yet I can, I can still reach the gun. I also will occasionally carry uh, in, a, in a pocket holster. And in fact, I spent an entire year carrying in a pocket holster exclusively because a lot of my students do. And I wanted to find out the, the pros and cons of pocket carry. And so uh, occasionally I will still carry in a pocket holster. Um, like I did today. I carried in a pocket holster today. Um, so those two places. I generally, for most people, will recommend that you, that you carry in the same place to the greatest degree possible. Uh, so if you're carrying appendix one day behind the hip the next and, and under the shoulder the next and all that sort of thing, uh, probably not a, a, a great way of doing things. And one of these days, Paul, you and I will, I'll tell you a funny story about that that happened to somebody else, not me. Um, <laughs> But uh, so uh, carrying it just behind the hip and in the pocket are close enough that I can train and and become comfortable with both of them. If I were doing something a little more radically different, I would probably force myself to focus on one uh, one carry position and simply orient my life and my wardrobe around that. Yeah, and and that really is what we have to do, Grant, is if we focus ourselves on one carry position, that helps us to become accustomed to it. It helps us to be more efficient in our... You know, I carry in a pocket holster every day in addition, typically, to a gun carried in the appendix position. And when I don't carry my firearm in the appendix position, I simply keep that pocket gun in the same place, the left front pocket. That doesn't make sense. I'm a right-handed guy. But I don't want that gun to be in a different spot. I want it to be on the left-hand side where it always is, where I can access it. And that's really the way that I handle that efficiency. And, and we'll have a chance to play with that a little bit in, uh, in July when you come down to teach your Defensive Fundamentals and Revolvers class, um, if I said that in the right order. But, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. So, Joe, I hope that helped to answer your question about why it is that I carry in the appendix position. I know that there are some detractions. I mean, if you think about where a gun, if it's you know just to the right-hand side of your navel uh, for a right-hander, just to the left-hand side of your navel to a left-hander, if you think about where the barrel of that gun is pointed, it's a little bit worrisome to some folks, especially the, the gentlemen out there. Um, you know, there are consequences any time a gun goes off while you are holstering or unholstering. An appendix, you certainly need additional precaution. I shouldn't say that. You need to take due precaution to make sure that you're not going to be interacting with that trigger at any point in time during the holstering or unholstering. But the benefits significantly outweigh the risks, and that's why I carry there. Um, this leads us into my comment about pants. I separate out the pants from all of the other uh, clothing that's involved with carry because our, our waistline of pants you know, really is different for different kinds of pants. I have a horrible time in 2014 finding a pair of jeans because everything is, you know, low-cut jeans. Apparently, you know, they need to be, you know, hanging just above the, the crack of my ass to be stylish. And the problem I run into with that is just like Grant talked about, now there's no long space between the top of my pants and the crease of my leg. Um, I prefer to find pants that are a little bit higher-waisted than fashionable. Again, they're covered by my untucked shirt 99.9 time, so they have no impact on my complete lack of fashion anyways. Um, but that's how I handle that situation. I really think that pants are a big deal. Your belt has to fit through the belt loops of the pants. If you've got an inch and a half belt, which is pretty standard for most concealed carry belts, you've got to have inch and a half belt loops. Also, the fabric of the pants can make a difference. I've got some pants that are very supportive, um, and, and do a good job in the waistband of helping support the holster, those can seal better every time, hands down. Those are my thoughts on that. Now, Grant, I don't know if you pay as much attention to your pants as I do. I don't know if you pay as much attention to your pants as you pay attention to my pants. But You know, this could go south in a big hurry. Um, I already did. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple, you know, interesting enough, uh, about a week ago I was in uh, the store buying a new suit and trying on various suits and, and pants, and it's, it's amazing, actually, how widely divergent pants cuts are, even in suit pants. And so I, I was 
trying various things on, and I found very, very quickly that there were, you know, maybe one or two makers that had suit pants right. that were cut to the point that I like them, and right. so I had to focus on those. Um, I still didn't get the pants that I wanted because I just couldn't get the right suit, so I had to compromise a little bit. But a surprising number of the pants, suit pants I was trying on, were relatively low cut, and I, I frankly I felt like my rear end was hanging out yeah. of the things, you know. Um, I'm fairly lucky, uh, like you. I live and work in a in a relatively casual environment, and so I've I've been wearing the same brand and style of pants now for probably 15 years. Right. I just keep buying more and more and more of them because the 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 waist is in the right place. They've got the proper amount of room in the seat. If you're going to wear the gun inside the waistband, by the way, not only do you have to buy your your waistband, you know a size larger, maybe two sizes larger. But the other thing you run into, particularly if you carry it behind, slightly behind the hip like I do, if the backs, if the seat end of those pants are very, very form-fitting, what will happen is it will kind of push the barrel into your into your leg there and will make it very, very uncomfortable. You need a little bit of movement room there. Um, a, uh, a, particularly if you're carrying in that position, the pants are relatively tight in the seat, They'll the gun will print. You'll be able to see the thing very easily. So. I've I found pants that I like, um, and I've been wearing these things now for, like I said, for about 15 years, and I just keep buying more and more of them. I buy them in bulk, so I make sure that if they ever go out of production, I still have some pairs, and That's what I, I actually do that. <laughs> That's what I, I, I'm the same way, my pants and my boots, Grant, you know, I, I buy a brand new pair of boots, and when they fit, I get a second pair right away, j just because I don't want them to go um, out of production. So that's fabulous. You brought up exactly where it is that Joe wanted to go next, Grant, and, and it really fits in with our next transition as well. And that's the idea of, of the cover garment. And and Joe's question is, is how much do we really need to worry about printing? And it's a really good question. Um, we want to make sure, I mean, it's a concealed carry permit, right? And so concealed doesn't just mean covered up, it means hidden. So how much do we need to worry about um, about what's called printing, being able to see the outline of the gun? What we can do about that to try and, and reduce printing. Um, what are your thoughts there, Grant? Well, I think we have to separate being able to see the outline of a gun and being able to see the outline of something. Right. Big difference. Because if, if the outline is indistinct enough, people are going to assume it's something other than gun, you know, a cell phone or... Or uh, a lot of people carry a multi-tool on their belt, uh, that sort of thing. So the idea is to reduce printing to the extent, ideally if we didn't print it all, that would be great. Right. But to reduce it to the extent that you can't tell what it is. If you can tell what it is, okay, that's, that's printing and, and that's too much. But if, for instance, it's just a, you know, maybe a little corner poke here, um, that somebody can tell you've got something but they don't know what it is, I generally think that's okay. Um, and so I don't know, maybe maybe you don't, uh, but I usually think that's okay. The only trouble I run into, Grant, with printing is exactly what you talked about when we run into the situation where we can tell that it's a firearm. And, you know, when I carry concealed, typically I'm pretty good from a printing standpoint. Um, I, I try and minimize even the pokes as much as possible to try and, and reduce the possibility of being made. But when I run into the most problem is when I'm walking into a stiff 15 mile an hour breeze. You know, again, my gun's carried right here on the front, the front of my body, and when the when the um, blows, it may blow that fabric right around that right and just make it as obvious as can be, and that is the worst time for me. Um, the fact of the matter is, Joe, um, and, and and Grant's exactly right. People have bulges underneath their clothes all the time, whether they're carrying that multi-tool, the cell phone, you know, I'm sure somebody soon is going to come up with an iPad case to carry on your, on your waist, you know. We've got all kinds of lumps and bumps. That's not unusual. What's unusual is a gun underneath someone's clothing that you can tell is a gun. So that's what we want to avoid. Bulges, no big deal. Shapes of guns, eh, it's starting to be a big deal. Uh, one of the ways the shape of the firearm is I carry a gun that has a shorter grip than standard. So if you would imagine a full-size Glock 17, I carry a gun that has got a grip that's cut down to the length of a Glock 19. So it's a shorter grip than standard. Helps to reduce printing. 
helps to, to make those pokes less gunish, if you will. And so one of the ways we can do that is by modifying the firearm. Another way we can do it is by making sure our holster and our belt work well together to blend that gun in with our body. The third thing is we can make sure that uh, we're dressing in a way that helps. And I find that layers are helpful. Summertime equals more printing for Paul than wintertime. In the wintertime, usually I've got on a t-shirt or a, a polo and then some kind of a light sweatshirt or long sleeve top. The fact that there's two layers over the top of that gun as opposed to one makes a huge difference when it comes to printing. I mean, really an enormous difference. And so think about that when you can. Um, you know, the size of the firearm can make a big deal as well. If printing is really an issue, if you're carrying in an environment that's non-permissive, let's say you have a, a place where you can legally carry, like your office, um, however it's against policy and you'll risk losing your job, concealment becomes hugely important and printing becomes an issue. So you have to take that into consideration from a contextual standpoint as well. What are your thoughts? Um, the, the first thing I would say is that uh, when I talk to people about minimizing printing, I point out that the further away from the belt a poke or a shape is, the more attention it's going to draw. So, for instance, if you're, if you're oh, I'm going to use my prop belt again here. Right. Um, nice. Yeah, yeah. So this is going to be really cool. Oh, I uh, Hang on a second. got to go. There it is. The reason Grant is able to use his prop belt is because he's not wearing any pants right That's now. That's right. Yes, I'm streaking um, for those of you who grew up in that era. But, okay, so you've got your belt line here, right? And if something is relative to the belt line, if it's way up here, you know, I've got a poke way up here, and my waistline is here, that draws more attention than if the poke is right here because we expect to see things on the belt. Um, right. So I tell people, first of all, eliminate the pokes here. And... You can do that, as Paul said, cutting down the grip, picking a gun that rides lower. Yes, um, the holster anything. helps that gun ride lower. Yeah, the holster helps that. Making sure that the belt holds the gun against the body and not letting it tip out too much, uh, because again, the higher up from the belt it is, here's my belt, the higher up it is, the more it will tend to, to go out like that. Um, so pay attention to, to where those pokes occur. Cover garment, absolutely. Uh, very important, and sometimes it's it's not even the thickness of the fabric; it's the weave of the fabric. Mm -hmm. uh, knits, for instance, uh, I, this is starting to sound like a, like a you know fashion show, but um, knits. Um, uh, you dress in camouflage. I can't see you. Um, everybody remembers that movie. Um, knits tend to to conform and and go over the gun and show the outline of the gun more than uh, than you know, the woven fabrics. So pay attention to, to how stiff the fabric is, um, how flexible it is. Um, if you have any questions, you know, find, women seem to know more about this and then, you know, ask your friendly local female. They seem to know everything about this. Um, you know, general rule of thumb, if it looks really, really good uh, on a woman's uh, anatomy, shows it off really well, it's probably not something you want to use to try to conceal your gun. Um, so cashmere sweaters probably out. Just just saying that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, uh, cover garment is incredibly effective here. And and again, in in the winter, layers. Yeah, uh, layers work really really well. Um, I find that, for instance, in here in the Northwest, we have a lot of rain, and we tend to wear, um, uh, or at least I tend to wear. Uh, wax cotton rain gear, which is relatively stiff, and y you can hide a howitzer under that. Nobody's going right. to see it. Yep. So pick your cover material. Make sure it's that it's sized correctly, because if you know what looks good on you when you don't have a gun on, again, just like your pants, things are going to expand. It needs to be a size bigger to effectively uh, cover that gun. Uh, so you need to pay attention to that too. Yeah, and, and that's pretty easy to do, Grant. Um, if you if you develop a relationship with a tailor, that can really be helpful. And and I did this uh, both when I was in the Detroit area, and then when I relocated to Ohio. You know, I simply uh, made it a point when I needed to have some garments um, uh, altered. I went in and said, "Hey, you know, is the manager around, or if I could speak to the tailor?" And I said, "Hey, this is specifically what it is that I need to do." I need to be able to conceal a firearm underneath my clothing, and I'd like your help in that. 
And, you know, the tailor kind of, his eyes got bright. And he said, well, first of all, what agency do you work for? And I said, well, I work for, you know, the PAC. That's my three letters, Paul, Andrew, Carlson. That's it. That's all I got. I just, I carry a gun. But he, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, discouraged from the project. He was really interested in the challenge because it's something that was different. It was something that was out of the ordinary. And so even if it's, uh, you know, just a pair of jeans and a sport coat that you have, um, you know, tailored specifically to be able to deal with hiding that firearm, um, it's definitely worth it. And in these, you know, clothes, if you buy good quality clothing that last a long time, it's worth the extra extra investment, excuse me, to, to have those tailored to help to conceal. So, Joe, I hope that that answers your question. And, yes, let's face it, the general public, even if they see pokes that look gunnish, they have no idea what it is you're carrying. Um when we first start carrying firearms, it looks like everyone is staring at us. It look, it, it feels like everyone is going to recognize we have a gun. But the fact of the matter is very few people, even gun people, realize we are carrying a firearm. Now, those that are expert in detecting it, they'll know even, even when you do a good job of concealing it. But those aren't the folks you have to worry about unless you're the bad guy. And, and that, So hopefully that answered your question. And yeah, Joe, I've been kind of watching. You folks are seeing me look down on my cell phone throughout the broadcast today, and I have to apologize for it. No, I don't have to apologize for that. Um, I'm checking up on, on our good friend, Matt DeVito. I talked about him at the beginning of the broadcast. You know, $1,700 when we got started, and, and uh, $10,405 is the last update that I got. And actually, Matt is uh, is just back online, and so I, I got some messages from him, and they're getting things taken care of. So if you're interested in helping out Matt DeVito and his family who experienced a really challenging um, situation with a house fire that pretty much has, has cleaned them out and they're they're unfortunately not insured for, you can head to safetysolutionsacademy.com forward slash Matt and there's a link there that you can use to uh, to offer some help. It doesn't have to be a lot. Folks have chipped in, you know, $5 today. That $5 means a lot to folks that have nothing. Don't forget that. So that's really important. So, so I'm not going to apologize, but the fact of the matter is, is that's what I'm doing with the cell phone. Grant, let's go... One step further, you started to allude to it, and Joe led us right into it with the idea that when we're carrying a gun, um, people might assume that it's something else, like a cell phone. You brought up the fact that we might have to reholster with one hand because we might have a light in the other hand. Let's talk about the other things that we should be carrying when we're carrying a firearm. Well, um... I'm, uh, of course, uh, spare ammunition, spare magazine, of course, that's important. Um, I'm a big fan of carrying less than lethal tools uh, with me because not every self-defense situation is a lethal force situation. So I'm a, I'm a big fan, and, and I've written about this before, I'm a big fan of a flashlight. Yep. Uh, incredibly useful tool, not just to be able to see trouble coming, but use as an impact weapon, and if you get one that's shaped right, you can use it as a kubaton using kubaton techniques. So I'm a big fan of carrying a flashlight. In fact, I think it's, it is it is one of the most useful self-defense tools that you can have because it allows you to identify stuff mm -hmm. before it can hurt you. So, you know, you're going out in the parking lot at night, allows you to see under your car, is anybody under there, allows you to check in the back seat, is anybody in there? Uh, you know, is anybody behind that bush? All that kind of thing. And even if you're going in from bright sunlight into a darkened room, you can look around the room. Is anybody here? So very, very useful for identifying threats. And then it can help you deal with those non-lethal threats that really compromise the, the, comprise the majority of, of things that we run into. So that's one of my big things. Absolutely, Grant. I couldn't agree more. The flashlight is the tool that I carry. I mean, this is horrible. I lost my flashlight in the past week, along with my knife. I'm thinking I left them someplace in in, uh, in Florida when I was down there. But anyways, uh, it's the tool I use more than any other tool um, is my flashlight, whether it's to find, you know, the pin from a watch band that's fallen on the ground, um, you know, and then shine, you get it to bounce some light back to you. Or to do, as you mentioned, you know, all of the things that are that are there when it comes to dealing with self-defense, or or finding whatever is lost in the back of the trunk, or the list goes on and on and on. Flashlights are a huge, huge tool. And then the other one is the cell phone. Um, I use all the time, both as a communication device for voice um, and making phone calls, 
but also now with uh, with smartphones for all kinds of other things as well. And that's a tool. I, I want to be able to get help. I want to be able to call the professionals. Yes, I'm going to deal with the situation the best I can until they get there. But the fact of the matter is, is I want to be able to alert them as well. So I carry a cell phone and I carry it uh, as charged as I can. You know, it's sitting here right on my desk right now working with me, you know, with a, a backup charger. I've got a Limeade, a Lime Fuel on here, you know, charging the phone up, keeping it lit. I carry one of these in my briefcase, uh, usually not in a pocket, but sometimes it ends up in my cargo pocket charging my phone um, to be able to keep that communication going because that's important as well. And those are really the two big things that I think are, are so very important as far as tools go. Anything else you want to throw in there as an accessory, Grant? Well, I, you know, just in terms of the cell phone, remember that, that personal safety goes beyond being attacked. Mm -hmm. it, it, it includes uh, car accidents and, and natural disasters. And out here we have to worry about earthquakes things like that. So the cell phone is an incredibly important tool to deal with all kinds of situations that don't involve bad guys trying to kill you. Um, just an incredibly uh, uh, valuable tool and I never leave home and it's it's in my right cargo pocket every time I walk out of the house. Right. Yeah, and, and that consistency grant that you bring up, I think that's hugely important for for all of our tools. I carry my flashlight in the same location all the time. Mm -hmm. I carry my cell phone in the same location. I carry my fire I carry my spare ammunition and magazines because, of course, as you know, two is one and one is none. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have to talk about that, Paul. Okay. <laughs> Check out Grant's Facebook post on that. Do a little search, folks. But, you know, I, I carry all those things in the same place that I can access those things when I need them without having to think about it. Now, it's always a big challenge for me at the change of seasons. You know, when we go to, especially from summer start to have a coat on with more pockets, uh, that cell phone inadvertently gets placed someplace or the car keys or any of the other things that I carry. And then all of a sudden I'm scrambling to try and, and come up with where it is. And so having that consistency is really a big issue. There's no doubt about it. Um, the final thing, Grant, and I'm not even really sure, um, and, and Joe has posted up the, uh, the link to youcaring.com, and I appreciate that, Joe. Folks, um, if you head to Matt at, uh, excuse me, safetysolutionsacademy.com forward slash Matt, you can find this link, or you can head to youcaring.com, um, and it's basically uh, a little donation site for us to help out Matt, which is really, um, really a challenging situation, and, and text messages are cruising across between some other buddies and Matt, and so I'm looking forward to being able to catch up with those guys and make sure Matt's doing okay today. So if you have a chance to help out, please do that. Um, you know, again, we're at $10,500 in less than 10 hours of, of assistance from the firearms community. So if you've got the ability to help out, please do that. Grant, let's talk about, and I alluded to John Steinbeck, the final weapon, the mind. Great quote from kind of an unlikely source. Um, something we need to carry with us when we have a concealed weapon, our brain? Oh, I, I would hope so. I would hope everybody walks out of the the house with their brain, although given some of the people in traffic I saw today, I don't think everybody does. Um, but yeah, you know, the, 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 the one of the most important tools I think is we have is our training. Um, that's a tool. It's something that, that we acquire. It's something that we can carry with us that will that will help keep us safe, help keep us help keep us safe, help us respond appropriately to situations, help us decide what to do, and to execute skills if necessary, execute the skills that we've that we've practiced hopefully, and develop that will keep ourselves safe. So our training, our and our brain is the and as Steinbeck says, it is it is the ultimate tool. Um, it requires more work, I think, than the other tools because you can't just go out. You can go out and you buy a good holster. You can go out and you buy a good belt. You can go out and buy ammunition. You can buy all this stuff, but the tool, this tool, you have to work at. You have to actually go out and get the training to, to learn what to practice, and then you actually have to go out and spend the time maintaining the skills and practicing what you've learned. This one requires more effort, but it's also probably more rewarding than any any of the other tools that you could possibly carry because even if you find yourself on an airplane where you don't have any of your tools, you still got this. You can still use this. Uh, you can improvise tools. It's very, very difficult to improvise skills and knowledge. 
Absolutely, Grant. That is a really important point that you that you bring out. If you've already got what a lot of people would call the mindset about how you're going to use your tools, about your willingness to be able to use those tools, your readiness to use those tools, it's much easier to improvise from the environment around you when you're actually missing the tools themselves. Because really, the, the big thing is that decision to take action when action is needed. Um, that's what really separates the folks that, that deal well with violent encounters and any kind of challenge in life and those that don't is the willingness to act. And I think that that is absolutely key. And, and the only way that we get that willingness is to spend the time training, to, to do the reading, the understanding, the exploring of, of ourselves, our environments, of, of violence itself. And that's that's how we can figure out if we're ready or not. And when we find out that we're not, we need to do what it is to sharpen that spear, to, to sharpen that edge of, of our mind to get us to that position. And so I think that's a, a great idea. Um, I hope, folks, that you found this to be a beneficial Google Hangout. You know, I looked down at the bottom of the screen, still got, you know, four folks that are actually in the hangout with us right now, you know, I, I guess it's uh, three other folks. We've got um, more viewers that are hanging on the sidelines uh, where where we typically have folks uh, waiting for us. We had lots of great questions, and I really appreciate your time. It's frustrating that we struggled through some some uh, technical difficulties at the beginning, but I'm thrilled that we've got this many people that are hanging on to the end. And uh, I hope that those of you that are not with us, you're watching us on YouTube or on Google Plus in the uh, in the days after the broadcast um, is completed, found this to be beneficial. If that's the case, again, please share this information. Now, Grant and I are going to be talking about these issues and a lot more specifically related to the revolver this summer. Grant's coming to train with us uh, January, no, July 12th and 13th, July 12th and 13th here in Cleveland, Ohio. He's going to be his, uh, his his own course, um, the Defensive Fundamentals of the Revolver course, and I'm really looking forward to taking this course both as a student and to watch Grant as a teacher because that's one of the things I do when I train is I, I look at other teachers and, and adapt techniques. And if you'd like to come out and join us, uh, we'd love to have you. Um, there's a registration link that will be up on the screen in the replays of this. You can head to Safety Solutions Academy and just do a search for Grant Cunningham and you'll find his information and be able to register for that class. Uh, we've got multiple folks registered already. I had a couple of phone calls today. People said, well, you know, is the class going to be a go? You know, absolutely. The class is a go. So don't wait to register to find out if the class is a go. Grant's coming. We're going to be buying plane tickets here in the next couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to have a great course. Anything you want to throw in about that course, Grant, or, uh, you know, we're going to be at NRA together next week. Right. Uh, what are you going to have there at your publisher's booth uh, for folks to get? Well, uh, at the NRA annual meetings next weekend, um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'll be at the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network booth, which is booth number 4262-4262. I'll be there on Friday afternoon between noon and 2 o'clock, and I'll be signing complimentary copies of my book, Defensive Revolver Fundamentals, which is the class I'm going to be teaching uh, in July in Cleveland. So stop by. My publisher has, has graciously supplied a, a, a decent number, but a limited number none, nonetheless, of books to, to sign and to autograph and to, to give to people so that they have this incredibly uh, good, infor if, I, if I can you know, be so bold, this incredibly good information that's in this book on how to defend your life or the life of your loved ones with a revolver, with a snub nose, with a full-size service gun, whatever it happens to be. So stop by the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network booth between noon and 2 at the NRA show on Friday and uh, grab a complimentary copy of Defensive Revolver Fundamentals. Sign up for the class, and again, it doesn't matter if you've got a snub nose revolver or a 4-inch end frame revolver that sits in your nightstand or whatever it is, uh, sign up for the class. We're going to be learning the most efficient way to run the revolver and the most efficient ways to use it to defend yourself at that class in July in Cleveland. So come out and join us. Outstanding, Grant, yeah. Um, you know, Grant, let me let me throw this idea out there. When you start signing books, I'm going to come, I'm going to stand in line just like everybody else, I'm going to get myself a book. Why don't we give away that book at the first Google Hangout we do following up NRA? 
we'll give that away to somebody that's actually on the Google Hangout. You like that idea? Oh, cool. That's a great idea. Yeah. So, folks, make sure you're back. What NRA is uh, 25, 26, 27 of April. So the first Thursday in May, I'm going to be traveling down to Tennessee. We might be late in the evening, but we'll do a Google Hangout, and uh, we will – no, Southern Ohio where I'll be training. No problem. We'll do a Google Hangout at the hotel, and we'll give away uh, a book. I think that's a great idea. So um, remind me to make that book and put it away. I'm going to bring my book, too, and get it signed as well because you know, it's, it's, uh, it's well-worn. Grant, tell folks where they can find you, uh, your websites and all that good stuff. Well, you can find all of my self-defense information classes and, and the self-defense blog at personalsecurity.us. All one word, personalsecurity.us. And that's where you'll find everything that I talk about in terms of training and, and, and defensive shooting and, all of, and staying safe, stuff other than defensive shooting there. Uh, my gun-centric site is grantcunningham.com. It's pretty easy to remember, grantcunningham.com. And that's where I talk about revolvers and rifles and, and all that other stuff, the politics uh, of, of guns. And sometimes I talk about the politics inside the shooting industry even. Um, and so we talk about all those things at the grantcunningham.com uh, website. So check that out. Awesome. Well. And, and of course, don't forget, don't forget Google. Uh, you know, Google, uh, Google+, Plus, Facebook, Twitter, Flipboard, all that. Outstanding. Stuff. Yes, we will catch you on the social medias. Um, that's awesome. We just got a uh, comment in from Justin Meesey saying that uh, he had a great time tonight. Justin, glad to board and uh, please continue to share the word. And, uh, and uh, I enjoyed myself as well. Um, typically, this is where I would pitch Safety Solutions Academy and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I'm going to tell you what, folks. Instead of doing that tonight, just do me a favor and head to Safety Solutions Academy dot slash Matt. Take a look at what's going on. If you can't afford to make a donation, please just share the link with, with uh, other folks that, that maybe can. The more we can spread the word, the more we can help out uh, Matt DeVito. Um, couldn't have him on the show tonight because he's got a lot of things he's got to worry about, but I, I did have a Hello Kitty glass to, to drink my beverage out of. So. I, yeah, Matt, uh, you know, I, I know Matt, and Matt is a great guy. Matt is responsible for giving me my uh, almost trademark sweater vest. And uh, I, I can't think of a, of a nicer guy than Matt. He's, he's funny. He's, he's edgy. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to go to the link. I found out about it when I got home tonight. Uh, so I'm going to go to the link. And I'm going to donate. And uh, hopefully everybody else will as well because uh, Matt's a great guy and uh, really needs the help right now. Absolutely. And uh, I'm going to tell you, folks, um, keep an eye out. We've got other works in the plans uh, We've got a graphic designer working on some designs right now as we speak. We've got uh, uh, John McConnell over at Combat Swag getting ready to do either a patch or a t-shirt. We're not sure which. Um, all proceeds will go to help out Matt and his family. So keep an eye out for that in the future. Again, head to safetyinstitutionsacademy.com forward slash Matt and help out any way that you can. Folks, get on out there. Get yourself some training. When you do, make sure you keep it simple. Please stay safe. And as always, have a great day.